Good morning. I want to welcome everyone here this morning. If you're a visitor, we're glad you're here. If you're a member, we're glad you're here. We'd like to invite everybody to come in and find a place to sit, and we'll begin our song service this morning. That one right there. Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls me away. Oh, yes. Well, the morning is bright and the Lamb is the light and the night night is as fair as the day, oh yes. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, oh Lord, I pray. There will be no sadness, no sorrow. Again, I want to say welcome to everyone this morning. If you're a visitor, if you're a member, if you're a sometimes a member, we're glad you're here. These cards look like this in the back of the seat in front of you, the side for members, the side for visitors. We ask that you please fill that out, pass it to the end of the aisle. It'll be picked up later. There's places on there for you to tell us a little about yourself. There's places to ask for special visits or prayers or whatever is on your heart. One announcement that is not in your bulletin sheets today, Ruth Clayton is taking up a collection to help Anna with school clothes for the kids and school supplies. If you'd like to help out with that, you can give your money to Ruth Clayton. Today is also our collection, our monthly collection for Tipton and Westview. You need to mark your checks and put that in the collection plate. If you prefer to do cash, Give that to one of the elders. This afternoon from 4 to 5.30, we'll have a baby shower here at the building for Ashley Story and baby Kai O'Neill. We'll be in the parlor, selections from Target, Walmart, and Bells and Bows. Also going on today, the Tipton Home and Elm and Hudson are sponsoring a, a summer fest, end of the summer, going into school. They will have a group called Vocal Union that will be performing starting at 3. The van will leave the building at 2.30 today. So if you would like to go, if you're one of the young people or a sponsor or a parent or just want to know what's going on, catch the bus at 2.30 here. 
Okay, Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock is the monthly Silver Saints get-together and potluck. Had some games. and love to have everybody come join them that would. Also, we're taking up collect, uh, cards for Ma Brown. Her 97th birthday is the 21st of this month. So go ahead and get those in. That gives us a couple of weeks. We like to shower our senior citizens with cards when they reach milestones. And one other thing that was in the reminders, but I don't think it's anything else this week, there's an opportunity for everybody in this congregation to be involved in the preacher selection process. And what it's going to look like is a survey or an assessment. But if you would take the time to answer the questions, it'll be available online, it'll be available in written form. If you will take the time to answer those questions for us, that helps us match our congregation to a, a minister that might be looking for a job. If you don't participate in this, that makes our information less accurate, and so we won't get as good of a match as we would have gotten if you participate with us in this. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that. That'll be the middle of this month, probably in a couple of weeks, and we'll let you know more as it comes, as it approaches. We will take time and pass out and whatever else we need to do during the Sunday morning so you know how important this is to us and to you. If you have any more questions about that, see any one of the elders. We can help you understand that process better. This is not an internal uh, assessment. This is being done by the Cyber Institute at ACU. They will accumulate that data and they will also help us understand what that data means as far as it relates to hiring a minister. I believe that is it at this time. Time, time to read. Today's scripture comes from Psalm 33, 12 through 22. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on the earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is his own failing love, who deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust his holy name. May our unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, as we put our hope in you. Would you stand, please? That's not the right song. I want to be where you are. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory. Take 
take me to the place where you are. I just want to be with you. I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory. In your presence, that's where I always want to be. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. Take me to the place where you are. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. Be seated, please. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow.
Pray with me, please. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for this morning to where we can come here and assemble as a church and as your children, Lord. And Lord, we pray that you'll bless our assembly this morning. Um, and Lord, we also ask that you'll be with those who are sick or have medical needs, Lord. We just pray that you will give them strength and encouragement and that we can be there for them and that we can give them encouragement. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and the truth that it holds and the commandments it gives us, Lord. We thank you for that guide, and Lord, may we always follow it. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. sing this song a lot sometimes we sing the right part at the right time and sometimes we don't and that's all right but i'm going to remind you again when we get to the second time through the men will be singing the moving part like this one right here and the ladies will be singing the jesus lamb of god part and i'll help whoever's having trouble with that and then when we get to the third time it'll be switched the men will be singing the Jesus Lamb of God part, and the ladies will sing the moving verse. Clear? I hope so. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my Jason, good job. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. 
that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chain. ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, the Lord has promised good to me, his word my hope secure. My chains are gone, <coughs> I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbade to shine, but God who called me here below will be In the lives that we live today, it's so easy for us to have distractions. Distractions that come in all forms, sizes, shapes, whatever they may be. But at this time, we need to try to remove the distractions of this life, of this time that we live in, and focus upon the cross upon Calvary. Let's pray. Father, we come before you giving thanks for the opportunity to take this bread and to remember the body, the sacrifice that was made for Christ upon Calvary, the sacrifice that was made for sinners like us. Pray that our hearts will be pure and our thoughts focused upon the gift given on the cross. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Father, we, we continue our focus and our thoughts upon the blood shed upon the cross, the blood shed for our sin. Father, we give thanks for Christ and your gift to mankind and through his suffering and his death. Bless us as we partake of this cup in Christ's name. Amen. Let's prepare our minds for the offering. We're certainly a, a blessed society living in wonderful times. But with that responsibility comes to be so blessed as we are. Father, we ask now that you bless us in our giving. May we realize that each of us have wonderful things, that we are a blessed group of people and that our responsibilities of spreading your word lay upon us. For the works that are done at this congregation and the support that is needed, we pray that our hearts will be in such a manner that is pleasing to you as we make this contribution. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Glad to have everybody here with us this morning. Uh, If you haven't already, please make sure that you have passed your cards to the aisle. Right now we're going to have a handful of our young people uh, be moving through the aisles to pick those up. If you would like to pick up cards, please go ahead and move that direction. Also, if I can get uh, the two that have the basket and the children's handouts to come on down. Uh, It's time for us to do our children's contribution. If uh, you have a child who would like to give a few cents or a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred dollar bill that doesn't get stuck in my pocket, please go ahead and send them this direction. Again, all of the money that we collect at this time goes towards raising uh, Vara, an orphan who is in the care of Ricky Gudum in India. It's a good work that our kids get to be a part of. It teaches them the value of giving uh, for the sake of others um, and also results in the most entertaining part of our service, which is my favorite every time, though I'm bummed because today Hunter didn't get absolutely run over by somebody, which has happened way more than once. All right, 
think that takes care of it. Uh, before we begin our five-minute intermission, we are going to, you're, you're good, girls, thank you. We're going to do something special as a part of this service. Um, whether or not you are aware or want to be aware, school starts back on Tuesday. Can I hear an audible groan from all of the people not looking forward to it? Can I hear a cheer from all of the students who are ready for homework again? Well, that got shut down. Um, this is a special moment. Um, we have an opportunity as a church, uh, especially in times where the educational system seems to be plagued by so much confusion, I think that's a good word to put on it, um, to support and show our love to the teachers and students who serve God in and as a part of that system. Um, so here's what I want to do, and we'll do this in two parts, and we will go to our five-minute intermission after this, so you can go ahead and begin to get up and move. It works for me. If you are a uh, teacher, educator, somebody who works for the school district in any capacity, please stand up. All right. Yes, absolutely. It's funny because I know the next one actually covers a couple of the people standing up too. Y'all can go ahead and stay standing. If you are a student who will be going back to school willingly or grudgingly, take your pick. Please stand up. I hope that you know, stay standing, you don't get to sit down just yet. I hope that you know that this church family loves and supports you in your mission. Um, I will, kids, I will help you with any homework this side of math. Go see Lindsay for that one. Um, teachers, we are praying for you. I hope that you know how much uh, we appreciate the fact that you serve in the role that you do. Um, my mom has been an educator uh, until she was smart enough to retire, uh, until she worked long enough that she could. I've seen the literal blood, sweat, and tears that she puts into it, and I know y'all do the same and more. Um, thank you for that. I'm going to speak a word of blessing over y'all, and then we will move into our five-minute intermission. But if you would, pray with me. Almighty God, the foundation of all wisdom, enlighten by your Holy Spirit those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of your truth, they may worship you and serve you from generation to generation and in classroom to classroom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We'll be back in five minutes. Go ahead and let's begin our five-minute intermission.
that was the signal to take our seats again. If you'll come on in, we'll start up our song service again. This next song we're going to sing, guys, it starts with a, a lady's voice duet. So unless you sound like a lady, you can take a little break till we get to the chorus. <laughs> Soft as the voice of an angel, breathing a lesson unheard, hope with a gentle persuasion, whispers a comforting word, wait till the darkness is over. Wait till the tempest is done. Hope for the sunshine tomorrow after the shower is gone. We an anchor so steadfast rinse the dark veil for the soul whether the master has entered robbing the grave of his goal come then oh come glad fruit Come, oh, the blessed of the heart. Come, oh, the blessed of the Father. Never, oh, never depart. We I'm on emergency coffee rations again this morning. The cough still has not left me. So, if you see me chugging, yes, I need caffeine, and also I'm trying to quit coughing. 
Um, been talking about the triumph of hope over experience for the past two weeks now. This makes week three uh, that we are talking about it. And this morning's topic and this morning's starting story, I think, play in well that we are at the start of school. Um, it is, as many of you can imagine, incredibly difficult to, to uh, get teachers for junior high classes. Anybody have a really positive, absolutely amazing junior high experience? Anybody have a disastrous junior high experience? A lot of people don't want to help teach junior high because they don't want to be reminded of their junior high experience. I uh, am one of them. So, uh, I've, as I've talked about this story this week and processing back through my own experience, uh, where I think today's particular topic, however, hits most for me. As many of you know, in my time at Abilene Christian, I worked in residence life. I spent a year as a floor RA and then two years as assistant director of a couple of different dorms. Uh, my job was student relations. We help students transition into university life. Um, some do better than others. Uh, and I'll change names because we do live broadcast, and I would really hate to think that this kid would click and watch and hear me talk about his story, but uh, it could always happen. So for the sake of today, we'll call him Brandon. Brandon was one of my residents at Abilene Christian. Uh, Brandon had a very difficult time transitioning. Um, and I'm not going to jump into all of the things that went on in the process, but I can tell you what the source of his problem, what the source of his struggle eventually became, or how it manifested itself. Brandon was horribly lonely. He had had a strong group of friends in high school. He'd come to school. All of his friends had gone somewhere else. But ACU had been where he had wanted to go since he was a kid, so he came anyway. And he got to school, and suddenly that core group of friends that he had been around his whole life was no longer there. For the first time in a decade, he had to figure out how to make friends again. And he failed miserably. And he would sit in his dorm room by himself, not talking with his roommate if he was there, not getting out because he was so depressingly lonely. And the way that it worked out was that the first semester, after the loneliness began to set in, he had a harder and harder time getting himself out of bed to go to class. Smart kid, brilliant kid, came out of high school, top 10%, could have gone to any school really that he wanted to. And yet here at ACU in introductory courses, he was failing for the first time in his life. Not because he wasn't smart enough to do the work, but he was just too lonely to bring himself to work on it. He was hurting too much to focus on anything else. He came out of his first semester on academic probation, having failed most of his classes and had to do them over again, and his second semester went worse than the first. We tried to get him help, but when all you can see is your own pain, Help seems an impossibility, or at least that's Brandon's story. In the second semester, he brought his whopping .7 GPA down to a .3. And he failed out of Abilene Christian University. Shockingly difficult to do. And he didn't fail out because he wasn't smart enough. He didn't fail out because he wasn't a motivated individual. He didn't fail out because he was too dumb to do the work. He failed out because he couldn't get over, get past, see a world beyond the pain that he was living in. That's loneliness. And it wrecked his year. A few quotes to start off with, I think, illustrate it well. Pauline Phillips, best known as Abigail Van Buren of the advice column, Dear Abby. I'm quoting Dear Abby in church. This is an adventure. She wrote, loneliness is the ultimate poverty. Mother Teresa said pretty much the same. The most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. Josh Whedon, writer of movies like Toy Story and The Avengers, said it much more plainly, or on my level. He said, loneliness is just about the scariest thing out there. 
Loneliness in its many levels and forms exists in the lives of all people at some point or another. This is a safe place. We'll try it this way. How many of you at some point in life have experienced loneliness? For some of us, however, loneliness is more than a fleeting feeling. At times, loneliness is the bone-crushing, immobilizing experience that Brandon had. Loneliness tells us that there is no place for us in this vast world and no person that can understand. Loneliness at its worst is far more than a feeling or emotion. Loneliness becomes a destructive reality. And the science behind loneliness is terrifying. Several universities, major medical organizations have begun to study this. And here's what they're coming up with, coming to realize. As more and more studies are being done on loneliness, all of, almost all of the studies reach the exact same conclusion. And that is that loneliness is killing us. Those who live under the cloud of loneliness, somebody like Brandon who I described, which comes out to, in their studies, roughly one out of every five people, experience a raised early mortality rate that is nearly double the rate of obesity. Loneliness is reaching epidemic portions in the Western world, and we're just now getting around to figuring it out. The burden of loneliness wears us down and breaks us apart. Brandon wasn't the only student I witnessed this in, but I could go through story after story of kids who struggled, not because they weren't smart enough, because they couldn't get past their own pain. They got caught. They got immobilized. They got anchored down. Loneliness anchors us in place, stops us from connecting, and stops us from being. It cements in us the idea that we are failures. Loneliness pushes away anyone who could care. And the experience of loneliness, the experience of loneliness tells us that there is nothing for us. The experience of loneliness tells us that there is no hope. For those of you who have experienced that deep cloud that I talked about, for those of you who have stories that at moments look like Brandon's, you know what I'm talking about, what it's like to be anchored in place and unable to do or be anything. Biblical text is full of people who struggle with loneliness. Look at the Psalms that David writes, just one of them, which expresses loneliness so beautifully, if I can say it that way, that Jesus quotes David when he's on the cross. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. David experiences a loneliness so pervasive that he feels as if God is disinterested in his pain. That's loneliness. This morning, however, we're going to sit in 1 Kings chapter 19. If you want to go ahead and turn there, look at another story where I believe this experience matches up well with what we're talking about. We're talking about Elijah. 1 Kings Chapter 19. Starting in verse 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. This text begins right after the, uh, the altar being covered with water and God showing up burning it up in sacrifice in front of all of the prophets of Baal. So inspired by God are the other people there that they kill all of the prophets of Baal who are present. This looks like a huge victory for God, right? God has won, the idols have lost, everybody recognizes it, and that's where this story takes place. Jezebel decides she's going to kill Elijah, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. 
he came to a broom brush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no ancestors. And he lay under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him, said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baking over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank enough and then laid down again. And again, the angel of the Lord came back and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. The word of the Lord came to him, said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. And the only one left. Think about those words. How many of you have had a moment in your life where you felt like you were the only one? You felt totally alone. Here's Elijah, who has just had what we would call a huge victory, right? He should be excited and ready to go. He's been serving God. God showed up. God destroys the prophets of Baal. And this is a moment to be celebrated. Except for Elijah. Who, when confronted with somebody trying to kill him, runs and hides and hits this moment where he believes, believes enough to say to God when asked, I am the only one left. In spite of Elijah's great triumph and in spite of God showing up and being present in a powerful way, in spite of all of the evidence that should be telling Elijah that God is there or is telling Elijah that God is there, Elijah is unable to hear it. Why? I am the only one left. I'm all alone. Elijah even in the moment of victory, is overcome with hopelessness. Even in a moment of victory, Elijah is overcome with hopelessness. I am the only one left. And it's anchored him. He can't do, he can't be. He's a prophet unable to serve He's hiding in the wilderness. He's praying for death. Is it because he's lost? No. He won. I am the only one left. So powerful is Elijah's loneliness that even when the direct presence of God and God's voice speaks to him, Elijah's own loneliness still dominates his experience. Elijah's experience is beating out, is snuffing out what hope exists. God speaks into that hopelessness, challenges Elijah to come back and serve, starting in verse 11. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. God doesn't start by addressing Elijah's concerns about being alone. He gets to that in a minute. Doesn't say, no, you're not the only one. There are all of these other people. It's okay. No, he starts by telling Elijah, go outside. I'm about to show up. Go outside. Stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire came a gentle whisper, and when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, put your prophets to death by the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? This conversation just happened. So deep is Elijah's fears that he is alone, that again, when God shows up, when God's voice is the only thing dominating the space, Elijah still fears his loneliness. Why are you here? I'm the only one left. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came, go to the desert of Damascus, When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat from Abel-Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Hazael, and and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. And here it is. Yet, I have... In reserve, how many? 7,000. I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. 7,000. You think you're alone? I have thousands. You think you're by yourself? There are plenty of others like you. Did Elijah know it? No. Did he need to hear it? Absolutely. But here's what I want to say from this story. It's not simply the knowledge that there are 7,000 other people like Elijah that gets him up and moving. Who is Elisha? Y'all know the story. Who's Elisha? Elisha is the one who follows Elijah. This, to me, is the part of the story that goes right over my head every time. God is the God who moves mountains and destroys rocks, shakes the foundation of the earth, and lights up the sky in fire. He makes himself present in all of those ways throughout Scripture, and yet not in this moment. Because in this moment, Elijah doesn't need to know the God who is powerful over all of the universe. Elijah knows that God. That God showed up and lit up a soaking wet altar. Now in this moment... Elijah needs to hear from the God who cares about him. And God shows up in this still, small voice for Elijah. And not only does God tell Elijah that there are 7,000 like him, he also gives him Elisha. God gives Elijah a friend. Y'all thought about that before? God gives Elijah the very thing he needs. God gives him a friend. We learn from our experience. And in this moment, Elijah experiences a God who cares about him. Not just the God who moves mountains, not just the God of angel armies, not just the God who is a jealous God who will light up an altar to prove a point in front of the prophets of Baal, but the God who cares about him, the God who speaks into Elijah's bone-crushing, immobilizing loneliness. Elijah hears the voice of that God. One in five. One in five people experience that type of loneliness. So that means roughly 20 people who are in this room, roughly 4,000 people in Altus, Oklahoma. One in five. That's a huge number, isn't it? It means one in five people need to hear the voice of God, the voice of a God who cares about them. Who's going to tell them? Well, Elisha, it may very well be that you're one of five. You may be 20%. You may experience this bone-crushing loneliness. I hope what you hear from me, what you hear from the other people in this room, is that we care. And that we want to be an Elisha. 
We want to be a voice of God that speaks into your pain and says, no, there is hope. I hope that you hear us remind you that hope wins out over your experience. The other thing that that means as we head out of this auditorium is that you have the opportunity to be Elisha to somebody. To be the friend when all they need is a reminder that somebody cares. That sounds like a really small thing, doesn't it? And yet it's the very thing that gets Elijah out of the cave. It's the very thing that Elijah needs from God in that moment, and it's what God provides. Go anoint Elisha to follow you. I have somebody who will walk this journey with you. Look for the opportunities to be Elisha's to the people who are hurting around you. At the end of it all, I hope what you hear this morning is that hope wins out over experience. And we're going to keep coming back to this point. Because if we are going to be people who follow God, that means we are going to be people who believe in hope above our experience that tells us otherwise. We are going to be people who reach out and hold on to God in spite of everything around us telling us that God has no power in this earth. In spite of everything that tells us that there is no control, that there is no hope, that there is no peace that is available to the followers of God, we believe, right? We believe in a God who moves mountains and shakes the foundations of the earth, and we believe in a God who cares about us. That is a powerful, mighty God. Let us be the voice, the voice is that tell the people around us about that God who shakes mountains and cares about us. May the God of all power and the God of all peace be a voice that speaks to you and be a voice that speaks through you so that we may bring a message of hope to our crazy world. If you have any need, we're going to move into our time of invitation. We'll have some elders, myself down front. We have some elders and their wives by the back door. If you have somebody that you need to talk to, if you are experiencing that bone-crushing loneliness, let us be Elisha for you. Let us bring you the peace that God has for you. Let us give you the hope that God has for you. If you have any need, come now as we stand and as we sing together. Have you a heart that's weary, tending a load of care? Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burden you bear? Do you know, my Jesus, Do you know, my friend, have you heard he loves you and that he will abide till the end? Who knows your disappointment? Who hears each time? Understands your heartache, who dries the tears from your eyes? Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know? Seated, please. Uh, Tyson Vernon has decided to be baptized today, put on Christ here with his family. Um, we're going to sing a song here in just a second. Steve's going to lead. If you would like to be close, again, uh, come through this door over here and up around behind uh, the baptistry. Uh, you can walk up and be right there with him as. As this happens, that leaves the front free for people who 
uh, want to sit down and be a part uh, right where they are. Um, we invite you to stick around for a minute and be a part of this, um, but uh, right now we are finished up service-wise. Um, so Steve, if you would, let's sing and let's welcome in the new brother in Christ. Hosanna, you're my king. I worship and I sing. I worship your holy name. Upon I, we worship and adore. Sing praise forevermore. Hosanna, you're my King Recently, uh, Tyson became interested in being baptized, and uh, after studying <clears throat> with his mother and I last night, he made to the decision to to be baptized. And Tyson, we are, are so proud of you, uh, this church, your family, friends. We are proud of you and we're proud for you. And we're all rejoicing this morning. Tyson, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for the forgiveness of your sins? I do. On that confession, I baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Glad that you could be with us this morning as I make my way out of the back room. Glad you could be here with us this morning. Um, always good to see uh, friends, see family in Christ, to worship together. Uh, this morning, always good also to have the opportunity to welcome in a new brother in Christ. If you stick around for just a few minutes, Tyson will be coming out that door. Let him know you love him. Let him know uh, that you're praying for him as a family in Christ. It is our responsibility to bring him up in the name of the Lord, um, to help him walk the path of Christ. Um, I hope that you uh, accept the burden that comes with that. Um, I pray that we as a family always be a family that lead our own to God. Uh, we're going to close in prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for today, for the blessing that it is to sit together and worship in your name. I pray for uh, us as we go out these doors that we would be a voice of peace in a crazy world, that we would remind people, uh, as Tyson showed us in a very real way this morning, that hope wins out over our experience. Bless us as we go forward. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.
Somebody does. I don't know if you're listening to my show. So. <laughs> 